Okay. All right. Well, um, I'd like to get started. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Karsten Lieber. I'm the Interim Executive Director uh, of the School of Environment and Sustainability. It's my pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of the School of Environment and Sustainability to this important talk by Mr. Gary Morasti, marking Orange Shirt Day. Gary uh, is the most recent addition to SENS, where he serves as Senior Advisor on Indigenous and External Relations. Orange Shirt Day commemorates the residential school experience, honors the healing journey of the survivors and their families, and reaffirms that they matter. It also reminds us to keep the process of reconciliation alive, as we've been challenged to do by Chief Justice Murray Sinclair. Thank you for making this talk a priority today and for making reconciliation an ongoing priority every day. Um, I'll ask Greg Peltzer to say a few words now and to introduce Mr. Morasti. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karsten. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, uh, thank you especially uh, for Gary for taking time uh, to share his experience uh, and his uh, experience with us today. And in that, it is our tradition, of course, at the University of Saskatchewan, and especially of all days today, um, to acknowledge a fundamental fact of Canada. And it's uh, an ocean born out of Saskatchewan, actually, uh, that we're all treaty peoples. This is fundamental to who we are as Canadians, Indigenous, and, and non Indigenous Canadians. And to acknowledge the, the university main campus, uh, of course, is on uh, Treaty 6 territory in homeland of the Métis. And in this COVID world where we're now extending out and have the ability of an ongoing reach to other treaty areas in Saskatchewan and those who may be participating and viewing from other treaty areas, uh, as a provincial institution, I acknowledge our other um, uh, First Nation uh, residents and citizens and treaty covenant partners from treaties 10, from 4, 3, 8, and, and 5. And, it's, uh, and this is important. And, and our Métis residents and founding peoples of this province. Um, and that acknowledgement is important. It, it, it is who we are as Saskatchewan people. It's who we are as Canadians. As uh, First Nations people uh, did not sign treaties with themselves. <laughs> they signed them with the, with the newcomer societies. And this is uh, the talk and presentation we're going to have today uh, from Gary is, is, a, is both a painful one, but it's also one which has hope um, and fundamentally core to what we need to address if we're to achieve reconciliation in our society. I've known Gary Krapes now, uh, I, I guess at least 15 years. And uh, Gary himself has had a, a remarkable story to tell in and of himself. Born in Winnipeg originally, um, we won't hold that against him, um, but uh, he's a member of the uh, Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation, which is one of the largest First Nations, of course, in Canada and in uh, Northeast uh, Saskatchewan. But Gary has consistently rose to the challenge when called upon in our society in different sectors of leadership. Whether he was the Grand Chief of Prince Albert Grand Council, serving all Canadians as a member of parliament, as a liberal member of parliament of uh, representing Northern Saskatchewan and Canadian parliament, which part of the story will be about. He is also the vice president of corporate uh, social responsibility for chemical. And his leadership transformed and was transformative of a company to become a gold standard internationally on how to achieve economic reconciliation and increase the life chances and opportunities for residents in the resource sector and, and becoming that model for other uh, industries, not only within Canada, but internationally. Uh, Gary was also the president and CEO of uh, English Rivers um, economic development arm, uh, Desnethe, again, setting standards. 
he's gone on now to be the vice president of um, the Northwest Company. And when you look at all these different jobs Gary has had, I've always really wondered if he could actually hold on to a job. But, uh, but Gary uh, is now part of our SENS family and uh, both as an advisor to the school and, and working with uh, Karsten and Marine in particular in how we can achieve reconciliation through an educational institution that's very important to the province. And also sharing his gifts, his experiences uh, as an instructor in, in a negotiation course and one about uh, relationships uh, with, with uh, business, government, and so on, so we can actually achieve economic uh, reconciliation. The story that uh, Gary is going to tell today, I, I think, uh, speaks volumes about Gary. Not many people know this story. Uh, he was the one who introduced the motion, and that led to the apology by Parliament on the residential school system. Um, and at that time, when you think about it, it was an yeah, enormous achievement. And Gary has been breaking down these kind of barriers and moving Canada forward. And there's a famous uh, saying um, by an American journal one time. And he said, one man, one person, one woman. One person with courage makes a majority. In a minority parliament, as a private member, moving a motion around something that was so profoundly historically painful, but necessary to resolve, to achieve reconciliation in Canada, the residential school apology. Uh, Gary was that one man with courage. Um, and without further ado, I turn it over to Gary Moresti. Well, thank you, Greg, for that introduction and thank you everyone. Um that the just wanted to share a few words in, in Cree. I grew up in my home community of Pelican Arrows, um, which still is very fluently Cree and always been told by uh, my elders and people I've worked with in politics even, uh, says always share your language. It's one, it's where our spirit is. It's where our culture is. It's where our tradition is. So make sure you always share that and, and that, and that the, these in fact are national treasures of Canada and should be treated as, as such. So thank you very much for, <clears throat> for the time. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I guess part of what I'm gonna share today is I can only speak for myself and through some of the experiences of my own family and, and take you on a bit of a journey. Um, and I think we've got about you know, I'll try to do it in about 30 minutes or so and see if there's some questions. I usually go over time because I usually talk too much and too long. So, um, so yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll jump into it and, and that. And, and really, this is about honoring residential school survivors and children. You know, it, it, it was having a good discussion. I've got, <clears throat> I've got four kids, three of them are teachers and one's in nursing. And we were having a conversation and, and talking about Orange Shirt Day leading up to it. And, you know, this is about a remembrance and, you know, it can be dark and somber, but it's also a celebration because people survived, they withstood, they persevered, they're here today, they've made a difference, you know. And so it's a balance of remembrance and it's also a celebration to some extent celebrating the resilience of the people and of the survivors and of the communities and of the people. So, so it's, it was a good discussion and each of my three children that are teaching today uh, in the city of Saskatoon, they're all, you know, talking about Orange Shirt Day and that. So, so yes, very honored to be here. Um, as Greg mentioned, I grew up in Pelican Arrows. I was largely raised by a few of my aunts and my grandpa uh, for the majority of my 
the uh, childhood. I can honestly say that I've experienced, and you've heard the term, you know, it takes a community to raise a child. That really was me. Um, I'll explain a bit on why I was born in Winnipeg, but, you know, it was my aunts, cousins, my grandpa that really raised me. And I moved around from different houses and felt the love and compassion for my extended family. Um, so I can honestly, honestly say that, that my community welcomed me and raised me and forever thankful for that. When we weren't in school, um, back home, we were out on the land. You know, my, my aunts and uncles, my grandpa, we were commercial fishermen, hunters and trappers. So we spent a lot of time on the land learning. That's where I think you become fluent in your language and in, in your tradition. And so I loved my upbringing. And yes, there were some huge challenges in, in my life, in many people's lives, but you know, you just embrace them and, and move forward and, and that. So, and I wouldn't change a thing about how and where I grew up. So a uh, bit of a side story though, because Greg brought it up. Why was I born in Webe? It's interesting because my mom was a residential school survivor. And I'll elaborate a bit, that, a bit on that, but she got pregnant with me out of wedlock and it's a very Catholic community uh, where I grew up. And I guess some way, somehow found it a bit untenable to be there. So she ended up in Winnipeg of all places. She had only ever been about an hour from Pelican. She was at the residential school in Sturgeon Landing, which was a couple days by boat, but driving today, it takes you about an hour and a half, two hours from, from Pelican. She ended up in Winnipeg and that's where she had me. And it's quite inspiring when you think of it. You don't appreciate it till you're an adult and you look back that somehow she found an apartment, being in a big city, uh, being a minority, speaking largely only Cree, but she got a job at the Fort Gary Hotel. That's why my name is Gary. <laughs> and uh, was, uh, you know, washing dishes and, and helping the, the cook and, and stuff like that. Then she sometimes work at the Manitoba Club, which was right next door, which was for men only back then, and uh, which is a different story and another story. <laughs> but, you know, she survived and she would work a lot of times at night. And so uh, she had babysitters in the apartment building we're in who would look after me, a, a German landlady who I faintly remember, and some other ladies that looked after me while she was at work. And they would hide me. This was during the height of the 60s scoop. They would pass me around from apartment to apartment because a couple times social workers would come by and, and that. And so she got scared the one time and, and then said, you know, I can't, I can't do this. So then I ended up back in Pelican, uh, raised by my aunts, which was the best thing she could have ever done. And that's always something we talked about when she was alive, that that was special and that was, that was perfect you know, what she did. So anyway, that's how I ended up in Winnipeg. That's how I ended up with the name Gary <laughs> from the Fort Gary Hotel. But I got one R in the Fort Gary Hotel, us too. Um, jumping into a bit, you know, my community of Pelican and the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation had very strong connections to the residential school era system and experience. Um, a lot of the people from our community either attended, and the majority actually attended the Sturgeon Landing Residential School, which was in between Flin Flon and the Paw. Uh, but a lot also attended the Guy Hill Residential School in the Paw. Many attended the residential school in Duck Lake, in Librette, and in Prince Albert, and then a few other places. So there were tons of people from my community who would, who would leave um, especially after grade eight or nine, because we didn't have a grade eight or nine in our community. I mean, grade nine, 10, 11, 12. So everybody had to leave. And some actually left a lot younger when they were five years old, six years old for various reasons. Um, so literally hundreds, if not a few thousand, probably attended from our Cree Nation, these, these residential schools across Saskatchewan and Manitoba. I think looking back, you know, being young, it was, you were aware, because what would happen is, you know, in August or early September, we would all walk down to the lake shore. These buses would come in and they would load up the kids 
and they would go off to largely at that time the Prince Albert Indian Residential School. And it was kind of weird. It was eerie. It was like there was dozens of kids there. There was the whole community came out and the, some kids were crying. Some parents were crying. There were some smiles. There was this tension. It was sad. It was uneasy to say the least as the kids piled into these buses uh, to leave for the residential school. I wasn't I didn't really know why that uneasiness was there until much later in life, but you know, I knew that these schools existed. They were kind of normal. They kind of represented an educational opportunity, but they also represented something sad, something maybe sinister. You would hear rumors, shocking, but kind of distant still. They, it just wasn't like front and center talked about. Um, but you would hear about the bullying, the violence, the isolation, the loneliness, the abuse, which was almost, when I think back, almost normalized. Like it was a rite of passage that everybody just had to go through, so just suck it up. And not realizing years later that, yeah, no, this is not right. These were not right. Um, so a lot of kids and a lot of my friends left. Um, and then when they came back, they were different, you know, sometimes way more mature, um, but there was something different. They, they, they went through some kind of transformation. So, you know, as I think back, it was like, you get this, like, you almost feel this guilt that you didn't go to a residential school. And I share that I did not go to a residential school and I'll explain a bit of that um in a in a little while here but um but yeah seeing those buses the smell of the diesel um the children the parents like that's that's so vivid for me and i had a bit of a flashback i flew into uh northern manitoba community a couple of years ago saint Teresa point and it's a fly in fly out community and we happened to fly in there in september and all these kids were there because they had to leave and they were boarding planes and I could smell the, in this case, you know, the smell of the jet fuel, but there was diesel there, like, you know, kids crying, holding teddy bears and, you know, some of the parents crying and they're boarding the planes to go to Winnipeg to go to school. And some of them were seven, eight years old. Some of them were 17, 16 years old. Right. So for me, it brought such an emotional uh, hit to the belly because you know, it just brought me back to when I was younger. So, you know, as I mentioned, I was raised by my aunts and my grandpa largely. Uh, my mom was a residential school survivor. Uh, she certainly had her struggles in life, but was also very, very strong. It's an interesting story because my grandpa and grandpa had 21 kids and 13, 12, 13 grew up to adulthood, but all of them were live births and lived for a bit of time before they either passed away of disease or, you know, in, in childhood. Um, but my, my mom was the second youngest. And what my grandpa and grandma did was they hid her from the authorities so she wouldn't have to go to residential school. Her and my aunt, the youngest aunt, and, but they, curiosity and my mom got to her she said and she, she said all these people these kids were leaving and I wanted to go so she didn't end up going to residential school till she was about 13 12 or 13 and back then you could only go till you were 16 so she ended up there three and a half or so years and that but um you know it, it was interesting and you know I, I've never I never had the conversation with my grandpa um about why they hit her and my aunt, but they did until she insisted on going. So, um, you know, she had me later in life. And as I mentioned, I was born in Winnipeg. And again, I come back to how thankful I am for my community and my extended family who were there for me and for my mom um, to raise me. Um, so she attended the residential school in Sturgeon Landing. And I just want to share a few stories. Have any of you seen the book? Um, the Education of Augie Morasti. If not, it's just a small, it's like 90 pages, like three by four inch book. And he was my mom's first cousin. He was my uncle. 
and he attended the Sturgeon Landing Residential School at the same time. On the front cover of the book is a mitt, and I won't give away the, the story, but if you haven't had a chance, give it a quick read. It's, it's an easy read. It's a very good book. It's very informative. It's very sad. It's extremely humorous, and it's very true, right? So when, so I just recommend that maybe read, read that book. And I knew Augie uh, for many, many years. He, he was a residential school survivor. He actually worked, I think, with David Carpenter at the U of S to publish that book and to write it. And so just a, a you know, a, a very good read, but he, he lived on the streets. He was an alcoholic, but hilarious, strong man. He was a tremendous athlete, a boxer in his younger days and, and that. But um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Read, read his book if you get a, get a moment. Um, another just story about my mom at the residential school. At her funeral about five, six years ago, uh, back home in Pelican, one of her fellow survivors, residential school survivors, at the end of the funeral, got up in front of the whole crowd and kind of shared some stories about my mom. But one, one she really focused on was how my mom protected her from some of the predators and bullies, which was not good for my mom ultimately. But she said she took me under her wing and protected me from some of the worst experiences that anybody could go through. So she was thanking my mom at the funeral. So, you know, that was, that was unbelievable to hear. I never knew that until at that funeral. She worked in the kitchen, my mom, and my mom would share stories how they would cut up the meat and the vegetables because she also worked in the garden. And the scraps from the food were the food that ended up with the students. It was broth and soup. So some of the fat was cut off, the gristle, you know, the potato peelings the carrot peelings, that kind of stuff. And the good food went to the, you know, priests, the nuns, the brothers that were, were at the school. And so they had the hearty meals and then the kids had the broth and, and stuff like that. And you think back and you hear about stories in recent years about experimentation on hunger at these schools um, and various other things that, that had happened. But she also played hockey. You know, she had some fond memories. She'd wear this long coat and these, they had these long flowing coats. She says they're out on the ice playing with the boys and got to be really good hockey players. And in fact, uh, my final story a bit on Sturgeon Landing was the late elder Phil Warren, who was a former chief of Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. He attended that school. And the hockey team that they had there was phenomenal. They would, they beat everybody. They were undefeated super talented some of them had nhl scouts looking at them you know i i know of one who went to montreal for a bit got lonely came back you know to play for the canadians or try out but these these the hockey was something that was an escape i guess not only for the boys but for the girls and and that so so just a few quick stories there about sturgeon landing and and that um and that so kind of for time's sake switch gears a bit and talk a bit more about the residential school apology and and that and um so you know as i mentioned as a kid i was somewhat aware of the residential schools and you know being down at the lake with the smell of the diesel and the people going and the stories and all that but you know it wasn't until i went to university at the u of s and I was in the Indian teacher education program where you begin to learn a lot about residential schools, about 60s school, about colonialism and, and that. And very thankful for my experience at the U of S and especially for ITEP who accepted me as a, as a mature student with a couple of kids uh, to get into university. So I don't think I qualified. I know I didn't, but um, they let me in. So thankful for that. And, but yeah, you begin to learn and you contextualize what you learned with what you saw as a child. And within that emerged a bit of a social activist, I guess, more like we got to do something type of feeling. 
And so, you know, and then as I graduated, you, you move, I moved back home to be a teacher back in Pelican for a number of years and be, become an administrator as well. And you teach about this history. And, you know, I think a bit of a side note here, I think public policy and schools, whether elementary, secondary, post-secondary, over the years have done a disservice to all Canadians by not telling the true story of Canada's history. I think omitting the role that First Nation, Métis and Inuit people in, played in nation building. And, and I think this, these should not be electives, which they largely are today at all levels of education. They need to be something that's ingrained within every subject each and every day, because these are the truths of this country. And so it's sad to see that sometimes that's still a bit of a big argument that needs to happen. But that's why Orange Shirt Day and the voices of the numerous survivors who rose up to raise awareness about this issue are so critically important because they had to take it on. They had to be the champions to raise awareness and, and call attention uh, to this issue. Um, so after I was a teacher, sorry for that little tangent there. Um, after I was a teacher for a number of years, I ended up as chief of staff to the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, as it was called back then. And you be became acutely aware of the men and women, the survivors who were speaking up. It was my first time where I heard testimonials from survivors and what they experienced. You know, you'd hear about Phil Fontaine when he was chief and raising this, which was like so brave. And many of the, of the other survivors who were speaking publicly about what they experienced. And, you know, this was so inspiring and motivating. And, you know, this was my first experience back in about 97, 19, 1997, 99, during my time as chief of staff there that you know, I saw the bravery of these people come through and it was unbelievable. And, you know, and then there were numerous others across the country who started to join in the chorus of calls to call attention and justice to this issue. About 1999, I got elected as Grand Chief, very honored. And I remember being, after being elected, immediately after the ballots were counted, I was taken into a ceremony by four elders and um sorry six elders there were four men and two women and they quickly put me in my place like within two seconds i was put in my place if there was any ego it i hope it disappeared and they just said remember you're just a snot snotty nosed little kid who skinned his knees who grew up in the north and you better realize that's who you are and you're nothing more than that but you have a tremendous opportunity here to, to make a difference. So be humble, be strong, but always remember who you are. And these elders were also residential school survivors who were traditional. You know, we had a pipe ceremony and, you know, I can't elaborate much more than that on what happened in that ceremony, but I can tell you that it affects me to this day. Um, so as during my time as Grand Chief, you share your voice and work with others to call justice to this issue, raise awareness, you know, call for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, not dissimilar to what South Africa had done, to calls for an apology, to raising awareness, to, you know, pushing for curriculum enhancements, for, you know, fighting for socioeconomic equality and opportunities. And so you, you fight and you push. Uh, hard for these and so you know we we try to do these and in and, and my role as Grand Chief I tried to do that working with others because there was a team effort nobody ever does this on their own so so but it was for me the residential school apology was still um, and caught and raising a, awareness around this was was still very front and center so in about I finished as Grand Chief um, in 2005, and then I ended up uh, pursuing a position to be a member of parliament for Northern Saskatchewan. And, you know, and 
you know, when I think back and I was, I was thinking about what I was going to say today, the first thing that always hit me was extremely honored, first and foremost, to be elected as a member of parliament and to represent uh, in, in the House of Commons the people, all people, all Canadians. And I remember going to Ottawa and I had been inside the House of Commons in Parliament buildings before as a Grand Chief to go and lobby, to go and, you know, uh, have meetings. But my first time walking in as a Member of Parliament, I didn't expect to be hit in the gut with the feelings and the emotions that, that I had then. As I walked into the place where the debate happens, right in the House of Commons, I had just this extreme sadness hit me. I was so conflicted because you're honored to be able to have and make a, a difference in Canada and where the legislation and regulation policies and the direction of the country is, is shaped and formed. But at the same time, I realized in the very chair that I was gonna sit in, somebody sat who voted in favor of the residential school era, of the starvation policy, of negative colonial actions. And so it was, you were equally odd, <coughs> inspired, but the prevailing feeling for me was some anger, a lot of sadness, but okay, what do we do with this now, right? So it was interesting going through that and it took me a little bit to kind of sort myself through my early days of being a member of parliament. But yeah, it was, I certainly didn't expect to get that stomach punch when I walked in, into that big, big room in that big house. So, um, so yeah, one of my priorities certainly was, you know, number one, you represent your constituents to the best of your ability. Um, you do your duties as a member of parliament for Canada, you show up at standing committees, you show up in debates, you put forward motions, you vote on legislation. And, and so you do your duties as a member of parliament. And I wanted to ensure that, and we are still working on everybody around the country for an apology and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to be established and various other things. So what I would do while I was in opposition was to push for these, you know, you would do your thing, you would rise in question period and he'd ask the government questions, you would raise these issues in standing committees, um, you know, that, that, that were meeting quite regularly, you would educate and form my own caucus, my colleagues in, in my own party, you would correspond with government, you would call for an apology. So you do all these things, you would work with other colleagues to try and you'd work with the AFN, ITK, MNC, you know, indigenous organizations to raise awareness and keep the push on and keep the pressure on. But, you know, it didn't seem to be getting anywhere. It was very slow. It was very frustrating. And, you know, the, the survivors, the organizations that were working on this were just going all in and working so hard. It was so inspiring. In working with my colleagues, um, I decided to do a bit more media and it was risky because, and I'll share it in a bit why, but I did a story, I did many media, but one I was very hesitant to do and to share because it just didn't seem right. But certain things that happened that made me feel, you know what, we got to share this story that I had heard from survivors that had been talked about by many. And so I had an interview with the uh, Globe and Mail and we talked about how across Canada at these residential school sites were the bodies of children buried in unmarked graves that never got to go home. And that these children deserve to go home. They need to be identified, they need to be repatriated so they can go home to their families. And that was a very tough interview to do, um, but it was, in my view, necessary. And it did get a, 
a reaction. Um, but as I said, it was very, I was very hesitant. And I think part of why I was doing this and why I went there, and I wasn't the only one to say it, but I had a position and a voice, um, is that we were hearing from government that their, an apology was not necessary, that these schools, these schools were designed to do good, and they did do some good, they said. That an apology was already given, that, and I think for me, one of the, the year before I put my motion forward, um, the Prime Minister was in the UK and he, he was giving a speech and I'm just going to take a bit of an excerpt of this speech that really got to me. And this was what the Prime Minister said. The PM said, quote, the actions of the British Empire were largely benign and occasionally brilliant. British magnanimity ensured the survival of the French and British approaches to the Aboriginal population, while far from perfect, were some of the fairest and most generous of the period." End quote. So that got to me, and that's where, you know, this interview we did about, you know, people don't know what really happened. And the image of these unmarked graves scattered throughout our lands, um, you know, needed to be shared amongst many other stories. Who gets to decide what happened in our history? Who gets to decide how those tales get told? And that's what really hit me in the gut as well at that time was, this is not right. And like I said, I'm not the only, this is a team approach. And I was lucky to be where I was, but there were so many people across Canada, men and women, uh, First Nations of Métis and Inuit who were doing all this work and for me to hear that quote uh, just kind of got to me. These injustices caught, you know, cast long shadows and they just can't be kept in the shadows and that was really where I was trying to get at and that they have to have a light shone on them to be exposed to that as a nation we can begin to heal and that really was my motivation. And to this day, I sometimes still question myself personally, was it the right thing to do? So then shortly after that, we decided to put forth a motion and, and our thoughts and my thoughts were that it was parliament that enacted the colonial policies, the residential school era, all these damaging pieces of legislation that really impacted negatively Indigenous peoples in Canada, suppressed and oppressed. So if we could get Parliament to apologize, perhaps the government would then follow suit. So then working with Ralph Goodale, Michael Ignatieff and a few others, we drafted a, a motion that would ask Parliament to apologize. And uh, so then we tabled the motion and it would be approximately two weeks before you would vote on it. In the meantime, I lobbied the Conservative Party, the NDP, the Bloc Quebecois um, to support my motion. And we got support from the NDP and the Bloc Quebecois um, immediately. And it was a minority government. So I knew that this motion would pass at that point. But wouldn't it be great if it passed unanimously, not based on a majority of the voters in the House? If we could get a unanimous vote, that would be ideal. That would be perfect. But at that point, the Conservative government at the time said, no, we're not going to support the motion. That's when shortly after that Globe and Mail story came out that I talked about and about repatriating uh, children. Um, you know, so I think that kind of got a, a reaction. And so they doing a lot of work during that time to raise awareness, to try and appeal to every member of parliament, regardless of the party, because this isn't about party ideology. This isn't about left, right, or center. This is about common human decency. This was about recognizing the injustices and trying to do something to set them right. And so I appealed to as many members of parliament as I could, again, regardless of party. 
And finally, on the morning of the vote, we got a call from the Minister of Indian Affairs and said, we're going to support Morasti's motion. And that was it. It was quiet. So later on that day, um, you know, the, the house had convened, the speaker was in his chair, I was in my seat. You know, we had 300 and uh, however many MPs are in the house. And so the vote came and because it was my vote, I got to be the first to rise. I watched my colleagues within my party rise. I watched then the NDP rise, hoping that they would. Then the Bloc Quebecois, hoping that they would rise in support of the motion. Then it got to the other side, to the government side. And I was like holding my breath. Will they actually support? And the Minister of Indian Affairs was the first to get up, then the Prime Minister, and then the rest of the MPs. So then, so then the motion passed in May of 2007. And then again, for sake of time, um, a year later in June of 2008, the Prime Minister issued a formal apology, uh, you know, convening everybody to Ottawa and to the House of Commons. Survivors came, representatives from numerous organizations. Uh, by that time, I had stepped down as a member of Parliament. Um, and, but when the apology was happening, I flew my mom uh, to Ottawa and we got to sit in the gallery um, for her to receive the apology, which was sweet to say the least. And she was 74 years old at the time. And so that was nice. Uh, like, I guess that's an understatement. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing. And, and that, so, um, yeah, it was, it was unreal. And so having my mom there to hear from the prime minister and from the government, the apology was, was certainly something special. Uh, and then of course, since then the TRC, um, was established. Um, this was the hard work of people like Phil Fontaine to, you know, the men and women, the assembly of, of Manitoba chiefs, FSIN, uh, women's councils, like everybody made this happen. This was all such a team effort across the country. And we saw the TRC take place, the calls to action be made and we've seen some movement, but there's still so much work to do. That's why Orange Shirt Day, like days like today, cannot ever be forgotten, and it must always be front and center. And I think we had a reminder of that with the murder of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Colton Bushy, Tina Fontaine. You know, these really tell us we got a lot of work to do. And that's why Orange Shirt Day, you know, is so extremely important. So with that, I want to thank you and stop at that point and see if there's any questions. So. Thank you very much, Gary. We really, really appreciate you sharing this very personal story with us. So again, on behalf of everybody in Sense and everybody who's listening today, thank you very, very much. You're Are well. there any questions, something people would like to discuss? Don't be shy. <laughs> I'll, I'll start off, Gary. It's, it's Greg here. And I know we've, we've discussed and chatted about uh, this story, um, a very important one, part of Canada that, that you're a part of and your family and community has been um, so fundamentally intertwined with. What, what was the thing that surprised you most? Uh, working through when, when you were in Parliament in working through the motion of maybe something that was a uh, surprise both that was uh, inspiring and, and a surprise that probably was um, to put it in your words we still have work to do. I guess it was the divide between the understanding of the average Canadian about this issue about the realities of Canada's history juxtaposed against the sheer resilience and bravery of the survivors and how much work they did to try and get it closer together. And I think that, that to me was probably, you know, 
most, um, I can't remember the term you used, it was most, but it was, it was, it was, a, it was really striking. Like the, the, the sheer determination, um, you know, to raise awareness and, you know, still to this day, it's unfortunate a lot. And that's where I come back a bit to the education system and public policy. You know, it should not be electives. This should be, you know, ingrained the true history of Canada because Indigenous people are nation builders. And sometimes on their backs, many times on the backs of Indigenous people, we became one of the countries in the world. And that history needs to be told, right? So. Uh, okay, Peter, we have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, I don't know if Christy wants to come on and speak or I can read the question. One of our faculty members, Christy Morrissey, has asked, what do you think is the most important thing we can do to facilitate reconciliation, perhaps focusing on universities? You know, there's a, and this is going to sound harsh, but it should not be the responsibility of people of color, indigenous people, black people to teach non people of color about this history. The greatest honor would be for, you know, white people to take this on and learn and, and embrace and understand. And I think institutions like universities and schools and corporations, you know, need to really focus on that. And people of color, indigenous people, black people will be there to help facilitate and understand. But, you know, in order to really challenge systemic issues of racism and, and move on meaningful diversity and inclusion beyond just the words of saying those things requires that that deeper reflection and willingness to be open and to learn. Excellent, thank you. Graham, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out? I can ask, thanks so much for your talk, Gary. Uh, it's just remarkable to hear it uh, right from, from you and to hear about your experiences. Um, my question is about, uh, uh, we have in Canada with residential schools. Um, sometimes collaborators in the communities where we're working are reluctant to work with the schools um, because of that history. And so I wonder if you have any advice on how we might, uh, you know, going forward, um, work with schools as a part of that collaboration and, and how to make the schools feel like a safe place for people who have, who have experienced that history. Could you repeat the first part of the question? You kind of echoed out there for a bit. Yeah, sorry. Um, so just for, for, for those of us who are working in communities where we're trying to collaborate with the schools, for example, um, you know, working with kids in the schools, public school and high school, um, some of the community members from that school are quite reluctant to go to meetings in the schools, for example, um, or to collaborate with the school because of the history that they, that they or their family have had with residential schools. It may. I wonder if you have any advice on how we can, um, you know, move. Go ahead. Yeah, it may or may not be because of that history. I would suspect that that's a part of it. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves: Are we approaching and involving and collaborating and planning with the communities as much as we can to facilitate their involvement? Um, having done and been involved in numerous. Uh, things like that. It's like what you're talking about. Sometimes it's it's the lead time, the relationship building, um, the the patience, and the joint collaboration and joint planning is so critical up front. And sometimes that takes a bit longer. Um, to me, usually those are that is usually the one of the biggest issues for seeing perhaps a lack of participation than anything else. Not saying that none of those other issues don't also apply to some degree, but it comes down to relationships and trust building and allowing other voices to be a part of, of that, um, of what's trying to be done, so. Thank you. 
There are a couple of questions from um, Maureen and Natasha that pertains to the 60s scoop. Uh, Maureen, do you want to speak to the first part? You're already on. Oh, sorry. Um, I just want to, Natasha is one of uh, the students in the program and she had just said earlier on, wondering if you wanted to explain what the 60s scoop was for those, we have a pretty diverse audience here, some of whom will be familiar and others might not be familiar with what that was. And I was wondering, attached to that, can you tell us how long the residential school system was in place? in Canada to give people, again, a sense of scope? Um, so, you know, the literature says about 150,000 students up to your latter question, um, or to the residential school question attended probably over the course of 100 years and the last one closed in the 90s. And um, they, operated throughout Canada and I cannot for the life of me remember the number of schools that were across Canada but they they had different names you know from industrial schools to the residential schools to even day schools to um, you know various other uh, forms mm -hmm. of these these schools um, over you know from the 1800s uh, to about the 19 uh, early 1990s uh, and that's so yeah, they were in place for for a long, long time, decades. The 60s scoop, and I'll do my best there. And um, th there was a government policy, and I think this is building on the Indian indigenous or the Indian residential schools was removing children from the homes to, you know, remove the Indian from the child, basically. 60 Scoop was a continuation of that policy or an adjunct to that policy almost where, you know, I think back, my children, my four kids that were born, they had a birthmark, a temporary birthmark at the bottom of their back. They called the Mongolian birthmark is what the nurses called it. And it disappears after a while, after, as you, within 18 months or before two years. But a lot of, you know, Kids were taken, oh, they were abused, they were beaten, look, they have this bruise. Well, no, this bruise is not a bruise. It's this temporary birthmark um, that, that's there. But it was an effort from about the 50s, 60s, through 70s and 80s to remove children from families, uh, sometimes for very nebulous reasons, like very weak reasons. And it was part of the continuation to remove children from their families and, and um, and that so you know they were really hand in hand and again tens of thousands of children were apprehended many ending up in international locations and certainly across Canada far away from home I was listening to a CBC podcast finding Cleo and that's a terrific resource to um, listen to a CBC I think uh, Connie Walker who is a Saskatchewan reporter um, at the time for CBC had done that and it'd be a great resource to to uh, to listen to. So. Thank you, Gary. Any further questions? No. All right. Well, we're also very oh. close to twelve. Dot. I got one last question for Gary. Uh, why are the Toronto Maple Leafs a better team than the Montreal Canadiens? <laughs> my media training says I'm supposed to deflect uh, and not directly answer that question <laughs> all hockey players are phenomenal <laughs> yeah just a, a closing comment is that you know when we talk about these tough issues it's important not to have it's not about guilt it's not about pointing fingers it's about this happened and what can we learn from it going forward to prevent it from happening again? And um, I just wanted to kind of close off with that, that comment.